Good evening, and welcome to Bing Nursery School's Distinguished Lecture 2021. I'm Jennifer Winters, the director of Bing Nursery School, and it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Andre Simpian. His talk tonight is entitled The Developmental Roots of the Gender Gaps in Science and Engineering, Children's Stereotypes About Intellectual Ability. Professor Simpian spent many happy days at Bing during his time in graduate school from 2002 to 2008, and who was thrilled to return for a visit, even if only virtually. Professor Simpian is now professor of psychology at New York University. Among other topics, he has investi investigated how children think about intellectual ability, what is it, who has it, and how these beliefs shape children's aspirations. Professor Simpian's research has been published in top journals such as Science, Behavioral and Brain Sciences, and Psychological Science, earning him the 2018 American Psychological Association Distinguished Scientific Award for Early Career Contributions to Psychology. Media outlets such as the New York Times, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, NPR, and The Economist have covered his work. We are delighted to have him here to speak to us on a topic that is of interest to all of us. Please join us in welcoming Professor Simpian. Thank you, Jennifer. So uh, thanks again, Jennifer, for that kind introduction. Um, I'm so very excited and honored to be here with you virtually and, and give the 2021 uh, Bing Lecture. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, I did my PhD at Stanford working with Ellen Markman, and I spent many happy days and hours at, uh, at Bing doing my studies and hanging out with the kids and, and um, the teachers. Um, in fact, you don't even have to take my word for it. I was able to dig up a couple of pictures. Uh, here I am with Ellen on my graduation uh, day in 2008. Um, and amazingly enough, I was even able to find a picture from Bing from all the way back in 2003. This is me in my first year of grad school. Um, and these are the stimuli from my first research project, which looked at language acquisition and uh, which enlisted Mr. Froggy here as a competitor. Um, anyway, embarrassing pictures aside, I wanted to express my appreciation to Jennifer and Java and all the teachers of Bing for the amazing job that they do, both with the kids um, every day and supporting researchers with, uh, with their work. My appreciation for Bing as a researcher um, has only increased with time as I realized as I grew up in the research world um, how difficult and time consuming it actually is to recruit families to work to participate in research. So it really is a, a, a magical place that I cherish. Um, today, I want to share with you some of the work that my collaborators and I have done um, to try to explain the gender imbalances that are still so prevalent in many fields of, of science and engineering. Now, one thought you might have in response to this goal is, well, that's kind of strange, right? People become scientists and engineers as adults. Like what do young kids have to do with, with this problem? Uh, and that's a reasonable thought to have. Um, so I want to start by convincing you that looking at development is actually a very important. But the answer to the question of um, why there are still gaps in some fields uh, of science and engineering is meaningfully informed by processes that unfold in, um, in early childhood. Um, Oftentimes, when researchers are trying to understand gender gaps in STEM, they perform what's called a, a pipeline analysis to figure out where the drop-off occurs, where women are getting diverted off the path to science and, and engineering. And here's an example of such a, a pipeline analysis, which um, I'll explain in a second. But first, a note about terminology that I shouldn't forget to, to make. There are lots of terms that people use and that researchers use in, in this area. I'll tonight mostly stick with STEM, which stands for Science, uh, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics, um, or just science for short. Uh, 
Um, but researchers who did this particular pipeline analysis that I'm showing you here um, choose, happened to choose a different um, acronym, GEMP, because they looked at a set, set of science fields. And anyway, regardless, the, the distinction uh, is not super important right now. So I'll just describe this chart um, using the STEM acronym instead. Okay, so this graph shows three lines. The percentage um, in yellow here is the percentage of bachelor's degrees in STEM that were women. Uh, the green, the uh, the blue line is the percentage of PhDs in STEM that were awarded to women, and the green line is the percentage of assistant professors or junior faculty uh, that were women in these in these STEM fields. And these lines are plotted from 1994 here all the way through to 2011. Um, the thing that I want to take, I want you to take away from this graph is first that throughout most of the 90s. Um, the STEM pipeline was indeed leaking women uh, in between the bachelor stage and the um, and the PhD. Right? If you look at this difference um, here, women are about ten percentage point better represented among STEM bachelor's degrees than they were among PhDs and assistant professors. However. Um, this uh, leak has seems to have been plugged by 2006 or seven or so. Um, the lines converge um, here, but importantly, the percentages stay uh, pretty low. We're still at about 25% um, bachelor's degrees in, in science. Uh, so wherever the leak is, and there has to be a leak for the percentage among bachelor's degrees to just be 25%, it's happening before women graduate from college. Okay, so. Then, is it something that's happening in college on the way to a, uh, to a bachelor's degree? Um, actually, no. Additional data suggests that if you ask high school students what they intend to major in in college, the percentage of girls who say they intend to major in STEM is very, very similar to the percentage of women who obtain bachelor's degrees um, in these fields. And what this means is that many of the factors that are working against women's and girls' full participation in STEM um, have already had their effects by the time kids turn 15 or 16 or so. And so for me, data like these I'm showing you here really illustrate the value of a developmental perspective on this problem. Yes, technically it's adults who become scientists and, and mathematicians and engineers, but to really understand why there are fewer women in these fields, we need to look um, a lot earlier. So how might we understand the developmental factors that undermine girls' pursuit of, uh, of STEM? Well, here is a simple, maybe oversimplified, but still useful theoretical model that we could use to understand these, these factors. Um, we know from a lot of research over the last five or six decades that the motivation to pursue an activity or a career is in large part a function of two important variables. How confident we are in our abilities in that particular line of work and how interesting or otherwise valuable we find that line of work, the second one here. The higher a person's confidence in their ability to succeed at something the higher their motivation to pursue that something, the higher their interest in something, the higher their motivation to pursue that, uh, that life in the work. Now, of course, these are not the only things that matter for motivation, but they are two important things that we know from a lot of research now. Okay, so let's drill down a little bit further. What makes someone confident in their ability to succeed in the field? What makes someone interested um, in a field? And of course, these are enormously complex questions that I'm not gonna give you a full answer to, but one thing that we know matters quite a bit is the extent to which there is a match between how our society views the groups that we belong to, that the baggage the society attached to our social identity, and how society typically portrays those who uh, pursue STEM, those who are in STEM, our collective stereotypes about scientists, mathematicians, and, and so on. If these two things match, all other things being equal, of course, we will be more confident and more interested in STEM. However, if there is a math mismatch in this respect, then it will be more difficult for us to feel confident, to feel like we'll be able to succeed. Um, and this mismatch also makes these careers seem unappealing uh, as well. And unfortunately, as you may have guessed already, our society's stereotypes about scientists are generally misaligned with our stereotypes about girls and women. And in fact, there's misalignment or mismatching across several distinct um, dimensions. For example, 
work by Amanda Diekman and her students and colleagues has suggested that there is a significant misalignment here with respect to the dimensions of altruism and, and communality. Um, the general public's idea of a scientist is someone, usually a man, who works by himself in a laboratory somewhere isolated um, to satisfy his own curiosity about how the world works um, and maybe also to make a name for himself win a Nobel Prize or something. Right, so it's very, it's a very solitary and somewhat selfish uh, pursuit. These stereotypes about scientists are quite different from the stereotypes we have about girls and and women. Girls are typically socialized to want to help others, to be altruistic, to want to be around others, and to to work with others, to be communal and to be collaborative, right? which is pretty much the opposite of how society views scientists. And this mismatch is likely then to take a toll on girls' confidence and in their interest in science. Um, what I want to tell you about today, the, the, the aspect of this model that my research speaks to more specifically, is another dim important dimension along which uh, stereotypes about scientists and stereotypes about women are misaligned. The general public's idea of a scientist is of someone who is brilliant, um, Einstein-like in their, in their genius. And unfortunately, the general public also associates these qualities of brilliance and genius with men um, more, than, more than women. These ideas are present in children's environments and actually absorbed uh, by children, which means that from a young age, girls' STEM aspirations are hampered by this mismatch between how they and others view scientists and how they and others view uh, their own social group. And this right here is what I'll try to convince you of today. This is what a lot of my um, research um, speaks to. The relevance of these stereotypes uh, to the problem of underrepresentation of women in STEM was, was highlighted by a recent study in which um, I and my collaborators looked at whether beliefs about brilliance um, as being required for success predict gender gaps um, across academia. So what we did in this study, we, we surveyed academics across 30 different fields, 12 fields in STEM and 18 fields in the social sciences and humanities. And we asked them a number of questions, most important among which were questions about what they believe is required for success. For example, one of the items asked participants uh, to agree or disagree with, being a top scholar of my field requires a special aptitude that just can't be taught. So what I'll show you on this graph here is the 30 fields in our sample um, uh, arranged by uh, this field-specific ability beliefs variable with higher numbers indicating more of an emphasis in brilliance. And we'll look at the relationship between this variable and the uh, percentage of PhDs in that field who are, uh, who are women. And what you see here is a very strong negative relationship. The more a field values brilliance for success as reported by its members, uh, the fewer women obtain PhDs in that, um, in that field. And this is when looking across the 30 fields in our sample. Um, however, the conclusion also applies when looking just at the 12 STEM fields specifically, which are our focus today. So again, the more a STEM field valued brilliance, the higher they were on this um, brilliance emphasis axis, the fewer women uh, obtain PhDs in, in that field. And this evidence is important because it implicates these stereotypes about scientists and, and academics more general in the form of these beliefs about brilliance and raw ability being required for success, but it implicates these, these beliefs as an important obstacle to women's participation in, in many STEM fields. So the idea here is that because women are stereotyped as being less brilliant than men, this belief that raw intellectual talent is required for success actually makes it harder for them to pursue persist and succeed in fields where, um, where this belief is prevalent. And there are probably many reasons why this happens. And this is another um, active line of research in my lab that I won't have time to tell you too much about today. But part of the reason for this relationship that we observe here is undoubtedly that members of fields that value brilliance are more likely to show bias against, against women, to see them as less likely to be brilliant as their male peers even when there's really no objective evidence for, for this evaluation. Another part of the reason for this relationship involves the sorts of psychological mechanisms that I was describing to you uh, a minute ago, right? Where 
uh, or by the mismatch between the beliefs about brilliance being important for success and the stereotypes that portray brilliance as a male more than a female trait might decrease young women's interest in fields to value brilliance and their confidence that they'd be able to have a successful career in, uh, in these fields. Okay, so up to this point, you've had to take it on faith that these stereotypes exist, these stereotypes that, that associate brilliance with men more than women. But is there actually evidence that these stereotypes are present in modern day American society? You know, we sometimes like to think that we've moved past these sort of antiquated notions like gender stereotypes. Well, and I'm sure many of you won't be surprised by this, it turns out that our views as a society haven't, in fact, evolved as much as we would uh, like to think. Um, and let me just give you two real-world examples of the stereotype in, um, in action. One comes from uh, Rate My Professors, which is a website that you might be familiar with. This is a website on which college um, undergrads can go and anonymously rate their, uh, their instructors. And they can also type in open-ended comments about what their experience like was in, uh, uh, was in uh, this person's class. Um, ben Schmidt, who is an associate professor of digital humanities at NYU, went and scraped all the open-ended text entry data from Rate My Professor and made it text searchable. So you can go to this website that I've included a link to there and include any search term you want, any adjective you want, for example. And it'll give you a breakdown of how often that adjective was mentioned um, across the 25 or so fields um, in, uh, on Rate My Professor um, in reviews of male instructors and a female instructor. And what I've illustrated for you here is the frequency of the use uh, of the word genius in reviews of male instructors and female instructors across these fields. And what you can see is that um, for every single field, the word genius was used in reviews of male um, instructors about two to three times more often than it was used in reviews of, of female instructors. And this is by no means a small sample. Right? We're talking about a 14 million anonymous reviews on Rate My Professors. Right? So um, uh, I should say that the same patterns obtain with the adjective brilliant. So when you search for brilliant, you get, again, a distribution that's skewed towards, um, towards uh, male instructors by a factor of two. Um, I should also say that this is not an overall bias against women. If you search for superlatives um, like excellent and amazing, those appear about evenly in reviews of male and, and female instructors. Um, and of course, given uh, the stereotypes we have about women, um, if you search for adjectives that have to do with interpersonal warmth, like nice and friendly, you see a bias in the opposite direction where uh, these adjectives are mentioned more often in reviews of women than they are in reviews of men. But data such as these that I've illustrated for you here reveal how much our society still views raw intellectual talent, brilliance, giftedness to be male qualities more so than female qualities. Okay, but well, this is college students, right? Do these notions actually come out at all in a developmental context? Oh, Andre. Yes. Andre, we have a question in the Q&A, which is yes. how is FAB defined? So it's defined as um, the extent to which people in, in that field um, believe that success in that field requires a special intellectual ability that just can't be taught. So it, it, it is measured by the sorts of items that, I've, um, that I sort of read out to you when we were talking about that graph. Great, great question. Um, so do these stereotypes come out at all when, um, when we're in a developmental context? Well, um, sadly, uh, it turns out that they do uh, big time. Um, so this is a, an article from a few years back by Seth uh, stevens um in the New York Times. He had access to anonymous um, Google search data by American parents in the 21st century. Um, and he was interested in what sorts of things American parents Google about their sons and, and their daughters, particularly with respect to um, whether parents are more likely to Google, um, ask Google about their son's intellectual traits, um, and more likely to ask Google about their uh, daughter's um, physical attributes. So what he found was consistent with uh, 
with the sad notion. So for every 10 daughters, that every 10 searches that the parents performed about daughters, there are 25 searches about uh, sons being gifted. So uh, searches about uh, sons being gifted were two and a half times as common um, as searches about daughters being um, gifted. Um, conversely, and sadly, there are um, uh, also the, the, the flip side of this pattern is also true. So their parents are more likely to ask Google if their daughters are overweight or even ugly uh, than if their sons are. I'm not even sure what you expect to find when you ask Google if your daughter is ugly, but this is nevertheless the kind of thing that parents sometimes ask Google. Um, I should, I should point out that these stereotypes don't match reality. Right? So if you look, for example, at the composition of gifted and talented programs, um, which you know, matches pretty well to what this question asks, um, you actually find that girls, if anything, are slightly more represented in these programs than, um, than boys. Um, also, in reality, boys are about 9% um, more likely to be overweight than, um, than girls. So it's not like parents are looking around and vertically capturing reality and then asking Google about it. These are sort of abstract expectations that, that they're bringing to the table. Okay, but um, can young kids actually pick up on these ideas, right? So this is where our research comes in. So what I'll go on to tell you about now is a few studies that um, investigated the acquisition of the stereotypes that associate uh, being brilliant with, with being a man. Um, and these are studies that were conducted in collaboration with um, uh, Sarah Jane Leslie, as well as Lynn Bian, who was the, the lead author. Lynn Bian was a former PhD student of mine who then went on to do a postdoc with Alan Markman, my former advisor, and is now an assistant professor at the University of Chicago. So in this study, we chose to start um, investigating the stereotype um, in a sample of five, six, and, and seven year olds. So we chose to start uh, looking quite early, not as early as preschool, but um, in early elementary school, which is the time when other stereotypes, like ones about math, for example, first seem to emerge. But this is also an interesting place to start because girls tend to do better in school, especially early on in school. Um, so if we found evidence for stereotypes about intellectual talent and intelligence in this age group, that'd be particularly striking. Now, an interesting complication in doing this sort of um, work is uh, how to measure children's stereotypes. Um, this is... Um, the age of cooties, five, six, seven, right? Where in scientific parlance, boys and girls show a very strong in-group bias. Girls think that girls are better than boys at everything, and vice versa. Boys think that boys are better than girls at, um, at everything. So you can't up and ask them, like, uh, you can't ask a girl, do you think girls are smarter or boys are smarter? Because what, what they would say in response to that very obvious question is going to just be in-group defensiveness, right? Like, of course, girls are better than everything. Girls have all the positive attributes and none of the negative attributes. So you have to be sneaky about it. You have to ask them uh, about boys and girls without actually asking them explicitly about boys and girls. So here's an example of how we, uh, how we did this. Uh, we told children stories such as this. There are lots of people at the place where I work, but there is one person who is really, really special. This person is really, really smart. This person figures out how to do things quickly and comes up with the answers much faster and better than anyone else. This person is really, really smart. Right? The important feature of this story, in addition to mentioning the traits that we're interested in investigating stereotypes about, is that it leaves the gender of the person totally unspecified. So I'm talking about a person, a person, a person. I never use a gender pronoun. I never use a name. I never use anything that would give children a sense of, um, of what, this, uh, what the gender of this person is. So then I can then go ahead and measure who they imagined, who they pictured, when they were listening to the story by simply showing them a bunch of pictures of unfamiliar individuals, both men and women, and asking them to choose um, which one, to make a guess which one the person in the story was. Okay. Um, by the way, I should also say, so a really, really smart is our way of translating the idea of brilliance and genius in the vocabulary of a, of a five and six year old, right? Like the brilliance and genius are fairly low frequency words, not the kinds of words that would be acquired by this age, but we think that talking about people who are really, really smart is a good proxy for, um, for them. 
So after they read the story, they saw uh, four pictures, two males, two females, um, uh, unfamiliar to the children, and we just simply asked them to choose which one was the person in the story, and we get track of how often they chose members of their, uh, of their own gender. So I'm going to show you some, uh, some results now. What I have here on the y-axis is the proportion of trials on which uh, children chose members of their own gender as really, really smart. And I'll show you uh, these proportions for five-year-olds, six-year-olds, and seven-year-olds, which were the uh, three age groups in our um, sample. The sample was balanced by, uh, by age and consisted of these um, three age groups. Um, so here are the results. At the age of five, uh, both boys and girls, as you see here, chose a preponderance of members of their own gender as being really, really smart. So this is still very much an anger bias at the age of five. Girls think that girls are really, really smart, and boys think that boys are, are really, really smart. However, an interesting, very interesting shift happens at the age of six and continues through the age of seven, right? So for girls, there's a big drop in the, in the, in the number of times they chose members of their own gender as being really, really smart, such that at six and seven, girls chose members of their own gender as being really small, significantly less often than boys chose members of their, their gender. So one way of interpreting um, these results is that what you're seeing here is the beginning of the stereotype that we saw among undergrads, already a professor, among uh, parents anonymously searching Google, the stereotype that associates um, being really, really smart, being brilliant with men uh, more than women. This sample uh, was from um, Urbana-Champaign in Illinois. So I, after I graduated from Stanford, I got a job at the University of, uh, of Illinois. So these are children from the local community there. So you might think, okay, so this is 96 kids from Urbana-Champaign, Illinois. I mean, how do we know that this is something that is um, in any way generalizable to, let's say, kids in the US? Yeah. Um, when I moved to NYU, um, this provided an opportunity to try to replicate the study with a very different, uh, very different sample. So um, with my PhD student, Joanna Jackson, um, we interviewed 203 New York City kids um, that were diverse, more diverse than the children that we had access to in, um, in um, Illinois, and we asked the same questions. And here's what we found. So what I've illustrated for you on the left here is the urbana Champaign kids uh, as a comparison. And this is what we found in the New York City kids, despite the very different demographics and also cultural setting, right? The similarity is pretty, uh, pretty striking. There's still a decrease per girl from uh, five to six. We didn't have seven-year-olds here in this sample, so I sort of cut out the seven-year-olds from the Illinois sample as well. But there's a significant decrease for girls between five and six. Um, and uh, at the age of six, there is again a significant difference favoring boys um, choosing members of their own gender as being really, really smart. And in fact, these data are, if anything, a little bit sadder than the ones from Illinois because there's a crossover at five. If anything, girls think of their own gender as being um, uh, smarter, uh, but then that, that flips to where girls are at the disadvantage here. Um, so, of course, you know, this is just two data points from two parts of the U.S. We're still not to the point where we can generalize to, you know, American kids, but it provides us nevertheless a firmer foundation for, for thinking and this is a general, uh, this is a general phenomenon. Okay, we've seen Champaign-Urbana and we've seen uh, New York City, but would you see similar things outside the U.S., right? I mean, this is, is this a global phenomenon or is this just something that we might see in U.S. or parts of the U.S.? So for a test of this idea, we recruited a sample of kids from, from Singapore. And this is a work that, that I've done in collaboration with Pepe Seto and Sichi Zhao uh, at Yanyang Technological University in, um, in Singapore, as well as with Daniel Storage, who was a former PhD student in my lab, who is now a faculty member at the University of Denver. And Singapore is a particularly um, interesting way of testing this, um, this stereotype. Uh, for a couple of reasons. First, Singapore usually scores very highly, uh, usually number one in international math and, and science uh, tests like PISA and TIMS, if you're familiar with them. If not, these are just like standardized international tests that are administered every few years to um, teenagers across the world. And Singapore usually does really, really well. And the other thing is that they're, they've never found gender differences on these tests despite the super high achievement level, and also despite both of these fields, math and science, 
being ones uh, that are usually associated with, with brilliance, right? So this makes Singapore a very conservative test uh, of this stereotype that brilliance is a male trait because there's no whiff of it that could get in their environment, at least as far as the, the data that I presented to you here are concerned. Um, there are a number of other interesting features of this study. We looked at slightly older kids, so the previous study left off at seven. Here we're interested in what happens um, after this. We tested eight to, uh, to 12 year olds, kind of like bookends with the previous study. Um, the other um, advantage here is that we um, showed kids not only pictures of white people. So in the previous study, um, we uh, chose to keep the pictures of the individuals that we were showing and that they were picking them on to be white because um, we didn't want interference from other stereotypes that children might attach to members of other races. But of course, it's important to investigate whether these gender stereotypes generalize across races or whether we're just looking at something that children believe about white people. So in this study, um, we had um, Asian individuals um, as well that we ask children about. And the last distinctive feature of the study is that we use a different measure, a more specific implicit association test, which is a test that probably many of you are familiar with and may have taken um, at some point. Uh, this test has several advantages, including, most importantly, that you can totally bypass participants' concern with whether there is a right answer, like a socially acceptable answer, right? Because it never asks explicitly are men smarter than, than women? And, and these concerns, especially since we're dealing with a slightly older sample, might be present um, in our participants. So on the IAT, let me just give you a brief, brief if you haven't taken it or haven't, uh, don't, don't know how it works, let me give you a brief tour of, of what the logic of the IAT is. So on the IAT, all you have to do is categorize as fast as you can stimuli that are presented in the middle of the screen as belonging to the categories on the left or the categories on the right. So you have the E key for the categories on the left and the I key for the categories on the left. And you have to press these two keys um, to categorize the, the stimuli that come up in the middle. So for example, this is a picture of a woman. I might press the I key to categorize her and the categories on the, on the right. Now, the crucial thing here is that on some trials, the two categories on each side kind of go together given the stereotype under investigation. These are known as the congruent files, right? So if you believe that uh, genius is more likely to be a quality that's present among men than women, then these two things should go together in your mind. So this is what's known as a, a congruent trial. On the other half of the trials, known as the incongruent trials, the two categories on the same side don't go together uh, according to the, the stereotype under investigation. And the logic of the IAT is simple. You just compare these two types of trials if in terms of people's reaction time, in terms of how people, how fast people sort these essentially presented stimuli. If people have a geniuses or male stereotype, then they should be faster on uh, congruent than on incongruent trial. I won't say too much about this, but you might have noticed the presence of a creative here. So the canonicals of traditional IAT does require a comparison trait. You can't just have male, female, genius, and nothing, right? So we thought very carefully about this, and we actually used a bunch of comparison uh, traits. I'm only showing you creative here. Um, we chose creative because it's positive, like genius. It's an intellectual trait. It has to do with how your mind works. And it's otherwise fairly gender neutral. Right. Uh, but uh, as I've mentioned before, we've used other comparison traits as well to make sure that whatever we're finding isn't driven by an association between female and the comparison um, trait. Okay, so in this study, we have 330 Singaporean kids, so it's a, a healthy size sample. About half were tested with uh, pictures of, of white people, so there are white targets, and half uh, were tested with pictures of um, Asian people. Asian target, um, half of the participants were boy, half were girls, um, and they ranged in age, as I mentioned before, between eight and 12. Uh, on the x-axis here is children's age, because we're interested also what happens with age in, in, uh, in the development of the stereotype. And on the y-axis, I have their IAT score, also known as a D score. Um, with scores above zero, so this is the zero line here, scores above zero indicate an association between men and brilliance and scores below zero um, indicate an association between women uh, and brilliance. Um, so let me show you what we found. So this is again the zero line. Um, 
these are the, there are two lines here, one for children's IAT scores for the Asian targets, uh, and one is for children's IAT scores for the white targets. The two important things about this graph to take away is that um, all of these lines for their entirety are above zero, right? So they're in the direction of associating men rather than women with brilliance. And the other noticeable feature of this graph is that they go up, right? So between eight and 12, you see an increase in the association of, uh, of men with, uh, with brilliance, which is um, really interesting. Um, we also looked at boys versus girls separately, and we saw very similar patterns. So boys were slightly uh, higher in their stereotype score than girls. So this uh, uh, brown line is above the red line here. But both boys and girls throughout the um, age uh, included here, ages included here, were above zero, meaning they were associating um, a men more so than women with uh, with girls. Now that we've documented the stereotype and sort of charted um, its prevalence across parts of the US and, and other parts of the world. What we are interested in finding out, and this is still something that we're actively investigating, I don't think we have a good answer to it yet, is, well, what are the sources uh, of this stereotype? What is it in, in children's environments that's signaling to them um, that uh, there's an association between men more than women and brilliance? One thing that we tried, um, we thought that this is a reasonable thing to try is whether their perceptions of who does well in school um, is a source of, of information here, right? So um, is it the case that kids uh, look around, uh, perceive uh, some people doing better than others in school and use that to inform their ideas about who's really, really smart? That doesn't seem to work as well unless they were mistaken about who does well in school because girls generally do better in school. So it wouldn't be a very, very uh, good source of, uh, of evidence given that they associate men with illness, but it nevertheless is a possible source. Maybe they're mistaken. Maybe they actually think that boys do better in school. So to measure um, who they think does better in school, we asked them a couple of questions. For example, who do you think has the best grades in school? Who do you think is the first in their class? And, and uh, to, to measure their intuitions about each of these questions, we show them um, a group. As for the previous test, we show them a group of pictures of, of children um, that were unfamiliar to them, and they had to choose to make a guess as to um, which one the child is that was um, getting the best grades in their class um, or first in their class. Um, and here are the results. At five, six, and seven, girls were more likely than boys to think that their own gender is better at school, is more likely to be first in their class, is more likely to, to get the best grades in their school. So this is, again, the proportion of own gender choices. And this red line at all ages that we included here is about the blue line. Um, and this, of course, makes a lot of sense since girls do get a better grade in school, right? So this, this is, uh, comports with, with reality. But of course, it's very different from what we saw on the task where we were asking um, who, um, who is really, really smart. And I put these two side by side here so you, so you can see just how stark the contrast is. So the, these are um, girls' responses to the question about who's really, really smart. And these are girls' responses to the question about um, uh, who does best in school. Uh, there's a huge disconnect. And in fact, when we correlated their responses to these two questions, there's no relationship between their responses to, to these two questions. So this, so this means that even though girls perceive their own group as doing better on schoolwork, this perception had no impact on their ideas about who is really, really smart, which is really interesting and puzzling if you think about it. Kids spend a lot of time in school, which is obviously an intellectual cognitive ability, uh, activity, right? So if you're not going to use evidence about who does well in school to decide who's really smart, then what are you going to uh, uh, use as a, as a kid, right? Um, and this puzzling finding actually inspired a new line of work in my lab. So let me just take a quick detour and tell you about it. I'm just going to give you um, a taste of it. Um, um, this is, I, yes. I Sorry, we have a question in the Q&A that asks, six-year-olds change in attitudes. Is the effect of elementary school an obvious suspect? Yeah, so that is, that is definitely an obvious suspect. We don't have evidence to pinpoint um, that. Um, 
But that is my hunch as well, right? That um, six-year-olds are all in school, fives, some are and some aren't, and consistently sixes are. And it's likely that the difference there is prompted by, um, by their exposure to the attitudes of other kids and teachers, as well as sort of like the, the broad exposure to society and its ideas that, that being in school every day brings about. Um, great question. This is something, as I as I mentioned, we're still actively trying to understand the sources of these stereotypes. So that is a lot of possibility that, that we want to investigate more thoroughly. Um, so coming back to this detour that I promised to take you on. So this is work that I that I'm doing with my postdoc, um, Jillian Lauer. We explore the idea that that kids think differently about the intellectual successes of women and men. Maybe they think that women and girls do well at something because they work hard and put in a lot of effort. Whereas they think that boys and men succeed not via effort as much as by relying on their sort of natural intellectual gifts. So to test this idea, we told kids about someone of unspecified gender, again, as before, except that sometimes this person succeeded in math, um, say, because we chose math as the domain here, without even trying. Math, math came very easily to them. And then the kids had to choose who the story was about from among four pictures of unfamiliar dates. So this is what they saw in about half the trials. Um, in the other half the trials, um, they saw a person, they heard a story about a person who also did really, really well. So this person also got the highest grades on all of their math tests. Um, but this time, this person uh, succeeded via effort. They had to try their best um, to, to get these grades. So the question is, will kids pick more women for the effort stories than for the natural ability stories? Will they assume that women are more likely to succeed in this particular domain through effort than through their natural ability? And I'll show you some data from um, a sample of 150 six to, uh, six to 10 year olds. Um, so I'll show you the proportion of women that were chosen in these tasks, both on the natural ability trials and on the effort trials. And what you see, this is all children, this is girls, and this is boys. What you see is the proportion of women um, across all of these groups, but um, maybe slightly weaker for boys, is higher on the effort trials than on the ability trials. These are significant differences across all children and among girls um, specific. Right? So, uh, kids who are significantly more likely to pick women as the protagonists of the story that involve high-level success via effort than high-level success via unnatural ability. So if kids believe that girls succeed via effort and boys can just rely on their natural smarts, it starts to make sense why they can think both that girls do better in school and that they are not as naturally gifted as boys. Right? Success in school is probably just seen as a matter of you know, working hard, paying attention, doing your homework. So no wonder girls do better, kids might think. But that doesn't mean that they're particularly gifted or anything. Anyway, as I mentioned, this is a bit of a, a detour to try to make sense of that interesting disconnect that we saw. But now let's go back to the main thread of the argument. So we can safely cross off perceptions of grades. There was no relationship between kids' impressions of who does really well in school and who is really, really smart. How about um, what they're exposed to in their own families? How about parents' own stereotypes? Do, would we find a relationship um, there? So to ask this question, um, we use the, the data from, um, from the Singapore study. Um, for about 160 of the kids in that study, we also had their parents' um, IAT scores on the same IAT that the children took that, uh, that tested their association of, of, of brilliance with men more than, more than women. So what we can do now with these data, because we, we have data both on the uh, parents and on the kids with respect to the stereotypes, we can ask, is there a relationship between parents and children's implicit stereotypes? Do the kids of parents who show stronger uh, brilliant stereotypes also show stronger stereotypes themselves, right? That's the question we can ask here. And because we had a pretty broad age range, remember this is eight to 12, we also looked separately at this relationship for the younger kids and the older kids. So eight to 10 year olds versus 10 to 12 year olds. So on the x-axis here, I have parents' own implicit stereotype scores. Again, this is um, 
with zero being the neutral point. And on the y-axis, uh, I have the uh, children's implicit stereotype score. And we're going to look for whether there is a positive relationship between the two, whether children's stereotypes track with their parents' stereotypes. And what you see here is that the answer is yes, but for the younger kids. So if you look at the young, the younger kids are this uh, lighter gray line here. The older kids are this um, older line here. So for the younger kids, there is a significant positive relationship between their own stereotypes and their parents' stereotypes. The higher their parents' stereotypes, the higher the children's um, own stereotypes. So to some extent, this suggests that parents are a source of uh, these stereotypes. The more a parent endorses this at an implicit level, the more a child uh, their child endorses it um, as well. Okay, so we've spent all our time so far um, here in this quadrant uh, looking at uh, Andre, about girls and women. Yes. Uh, Andre, there's a clarifying question. How did the children define smart? Um, so for um, all of these, we're relying on children's intuitive understanding of, uh, of smart, right? So we actually have, in some of the studies with younger kids, we have an extensive battery that, um, that asks them, like, imagine a kid who behaves this way. Is this kid smart or not smart? Um, so that we can assess quantitatively whether the children understand what we mean by the word smart. Um, and the vast majority of kids pass it, and we can look at the data both with and without the kids who uh, fail this, like, quiz, this, this, uh, this question there about what it means to be smart. So we are confident that kids um, understand what smart means in the same way that typically adults uh, do and how adults understand smart is another complicated question, right? That I, I'm not going to get into here because that in and of itself is something that um, uh, the psychologists study, right? But it seems that um, you know we're relying on kids' sort of spontaneous um, lay intuitions about what it means to be smart, which is of course what they use in their everyday life to make life to make decisions about what careers are for them or not. They don't have an IQ threshold. They don't have you know, anything more precise than their own intuitions about what it means to be smart in thinking about their own abilities and in thinking about what to do with their, their lives. But great question. Um, so we've been talking a lot about um, uh, stereotypes about uh, men and women's intellectual abilities over here. Um, my collaborators and I are just now beginning to look at the development of kids' associations with people who do math and, and science, so not just gender, but who, who do, what do they think is required for success in math and science, who pursues these fields. And we have just a little bit of evidence, which I won't tell you too much about because it's too preliminary, but uh, just uh, a nugget is that we're seeing that as early as first grade, kids start reporting that you have to be really, really smart to be good at math, more so than to be good at, at reading and writing. So already at the moment they start elementary school, uh, well, I guess first grade, which is not quite the beginning of elementary school, um, they seem to be differentiating between, between domains in terms of what their society perceives as their requirement for success. They're already um, reporting that to be really good at math, you have to be really, really smart, more so than to be um, really good at um, reading and writing. But in any case, even without solid evidence on whether children um, have these associations, we can still start to investigate what effect these stereotypes that we've been talking about the ones at the bottom here, might have on kids' confidence and interest by simply showing kids a new sort of activity they don't know anything about um, and telling them, right, that it's for brilliant people, for, for people who are really, really smart, right? So we're introducing them to a novel activity. We can define how they think about that activity. The question here is, would girls' interest, confidence, motivation suffer as a result of being told that this activity that they've never seen before, that they don't know anything about, um, is for kids who are uh, really, really smart. So do, do these stereotypes matter um, early in life? So our first study on this topic, we started with six and seven year olds. So we started with six and seven year olds because that's the age at which we had seen traces of that stereotype that associate men more than women with, with brilliance. So if these stereotypes already have bite, um, you know, we should see differences. We should see them undermining girls' interest and confidence in, um, in activities that are said to be for kids who are really 
one. So um, what we did with these kids is we introduced them to two novel, unfamiliar games, things they had never seen before. We, give them, we gave them unfamiliar names, Starkey and Impact, and we described them in one of two ways. So we described them either as um, games for kids who are really, really smart. Only smart kids can be good at this game. Or for the other half of the kids, we described them as uh, games for kids who try really, really hard. Only hardworking kids can be good at this game, right? So otherwise, the games were exactly the same. And in fact, the same game was shown to half the kids and described one way and to the other half and described the other way. So there isn't anything about the games themselves um, that, that would prompt kids to respond a certain way other than how we described uh, how we described them. After we introduced them to these games, we measured their interests consistent with um, you know, like the, our question, research question of whether these messages about games being for kids who are really, really smart undermine children's motivation. Um, so we asked them, do you like the Zerky game? Imagine you're playing it, would you feel happy or sad? If you had a chance to do something tomorrow, would you do this or would you do something else, right? So just a, a broad child-friendly measure of, of interest in these activities. Um, and so since kids at this age, remember we're talking six and seven-year-olds, already show signs of endorsing the stereotype that associates men more than women with, uh, with brilliance, we predict that they um, would potentially show differential effects by gender of messages about needing to be really, really smart to be good at this game, such that that message might be more undermining for girls than for boys, whereas messages about being hardworking um, as a requirement might not have much of, a, much of an effect. And here's what we found, consistent with the prediction that I was just telling you about, when we describe these games, as being for kids who are really, really smart, um, girls' interest in, in, in these games suffered. It was undermined. So when these games are described as being for kids who are really, really smart, already at the young age of six and seven, um, girls reported less interest in pursuing these games than boys did. However, when the exact same games were described with just slightly different language, we just changed a few words, as being for kids who try really, really hard, there's no difference uh, difference between, right? So, um, and of course, what we're interested in here is not Zarki and Impact, right? Like we are interested in their attitudes toward science and math. Um, the idea being that once they sort of um, catch a whiff of the fact that their society thinks as math and science as being for kids who are really, really smart, which we do, and we signal that to kids, um, then the same effect might hold where girls might, um, th those messages might undermine girls' interest in these, um, in these activities. Um, and importantly, in this, in this uh, study, we also measured children's own stereotypes, and we saw that their preferences for the smart game were predicted by the endorsement of the gender stereotypes by brilliance. So, for example, the girls who show the lowest interest in, uh, in the game for kids who are really, really smart were also the girls who are most likely to associate being um, really, really smart with uh, members of the opposite uh, of, of the other gender. Um, last empirical study that I want to show you here. So we can make a, a different prediction, uh, an additional prediction with respect to the effect that these stereotypes might have on children's motivation. So in the previous study, the one that I just showed you, we were looking at six and seven year olds. Um, and we chose those because uh, kids at that age show traces of that stereotype that associates brilliance with men more than women. But five year olds don't. So what if we compared five year olds with six year olds? Right? Like if, we sh if we show five year olds and six year olds a game, novel game, they've never seen it before, and we describe it as being for kids who are really, really smart. Would five-year-old boys and girls react similarly to it because they haven't yet acquired that cultural notion that being really, really smart is more of a man thing than a woman thing? Um, and in contrast with six-year-olds, again, show a gender difference with messages about needing to be really, really smart, undermining girls' motivation. So this is the question that we, we ask here. So in this study, we um, recruited 96 kids, 48 boys, 48 girls, half and half as usual. And this time there are half five-year-olds and half six-year-olds, so kind of like spanning that boundary um, at, that, that defines the acquisition of the gender balance stereotype. Um, in this study, we only had the smart game, so we, we dropped the, the control hardworking game. So everyone saw uh, an unfamiliar game that was described as being for kids who are smart. And the prediction here is that five-year-olds should show no or little gender difference, whereas six-year-olds should, again, as in the previous study, um, show um, a gender difference. 
This is what we found. So again, on the y-axis, you have children's average um, interest score. Among five-year-olds, when you introduce them to this unfamiliar game and you describe it as being for kids who are really, really smart, you don't actually see a significant difference. If anything, numerically, girls are slightly more interested in it than boys, but this is not statistically reliable. However, among six-year-olds, again, as you saw before, messages about needing to be really, really smart to be good at this game undermine girls, um, undermine girls' motivation. So, the takeaway here is that starting around the age of six, um, girls' interest in activities said to require smarts, like STEM is said to require in real life, was already lower than, uh, than boys. And this differential interest, although it may be small at the age of six or seven, could actually have a, a tremendous cumulative impact. We're thinking, you know, like over the next five, 10 years of, uh, of girls carrying these ideas around. Um, that they may not take advantage of the kinds of opportunities that might actually increase their skill in, in these domains, such that by the time they actually come to making a decision about what career to pursue, some doors might not even be open to them as a result of a sort of the accumulating effects of these uh, you know, potentially subtle stereotypes. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is you know, what do we do in light of all this, right? Um, and admittedly, this is the part of this research program that we're, you know, is at the, at the most sort of incipient stages. We haven't, we've been sort of in the thick of trying to figure out what this phenomenon is like, characterizing it and understanding the mechanisms. We haven't yet done the careful work uh, to understand what to do um, in light of it. But let me tell you some of the things that we know um, from related research, as well as some things that follow directly from the, the research that I've shown. So, what are some practical lessons that are suggested by this research? As parents of girls and parents of boys whom we want to raise as, as good allies, what can we do concretely um, to, to remove some of the obstacles that, um, that currently stand in the way of girls' stand pursuit? One thing that follows very directly from, from this research is that um, uh, changing the messages that we send to children about what's required for success in STEM might have a beneficial effect. So to the extent that we actually manage to convince children that being good at math and science is not a matter of um, genius and, and giftedness, but rather um, in large part a matter of, uh, of dedication and hard work. Um, so it's like a growth mindset right along the lines of what Carol Dweck has, uh, has suggested for many years um, is going to be productive in terms of a sort of defanging, uh, removing the power of these stereotypes to make some children uh, feel less welcome and less capable to succeed in STEM than, um, than others. We, of course, might also want to intervene directly on these stereotypes. We might want to um, talk to girls and tell them that they are just as smart as, as boys are. But we have to be mindful of the subtle implications of our language. In fact, in, um, in research that was done at Bing by another student of Ellen, Ellie Chestnut, we know that you know, the, our first impulse is saying, girls are just as smart as boys are, or girls are just as good as boys in math and science, might actually backfire because we're, we're, we're comparing girls to boys who are, um, even young children perceive as the standard in this sentence. When you say girls are just as good as boys, boys are actually perceived as being better at whatever it is we're talking about, also naturally good at the thing that we're talking about. So, uh, the way you try to tackle these stereotypes is really important, and nuances in the language make, make a lot of difference. Um, a much better way of talking about this is by putting girls and boys on equal footing and saying something like, girls and boys are equally good at math or equally, um, equally smart. This language um, Ellie and Ellen have suggested is much more effective in actually conveying the intended message. A very popular strategy that's all, often used to encourage um, girls and members of other underrepresented groups to, to pursue science is to expose them to successful role models, right? So exposing girls to successful female role models might be an effective strategy. But as with the language to combat stereotypes, things are pretty complicated here. There is a large literature and, and largely contradictory literature on what works. What, what do you say about a role model to actually make it motivating as opposed to not motivating or actually even demotivating some studies have found. So it's important to emphasize the role model similarity to the child. It's important that the child understands how they could be that person at some point in the future. And it's important to also portray the role model success in a way that seems attainable. You know, so talking about you know, Marie Curie's two Nobel Prizes, 
while it's certainly an astonishing accomplishment, that might actually backfire in terms of motivating a young girl to pursue science insofar as it seems so beyond what an ordinary person can, um, can achieve. Anyway, so these are some of the things that I wanted to mention here, but if you're interested, uh, my uh, PhD student, Joanna Boston, now Joanna Jackson, and I have tried to distill in a recent article um, all the recommendations from this large and unwieldy literature. So if you're interested in this, um, I point you to my, in, on my website, there's a publications page and there's a, a paper titled, How Do We Encourage Gifted Girls to Pursue and Succeed in Science and Engineering? And this applies just, just not just to girls, but also um, any child that might show some hesitation or might be um, stereotyped negative in, in STEM context. And I'm going to say my, yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. There's a question in the Q&A that talks about, is there a change in cognitive development that may explain why six-year-olds, but not five-year-olds, just one year gap, started to have the differential interest or a preference for smart activities? What is the potential explanation? So my preferred explanation and the, the explanation that we have evidence for there is that um, between five and six is also the time when children are acquiring these stereotypes that tie being really, really smart with uh, males more than females, with men more than women, with boys more than girls. So that when you as a child, you're exposed to an activity that um, is portrayed as requiring this uh, high level intellectual ability being really, really smart, then if you as a girl, you've been exposed to this stereotype to some extent, maybe you're internalizing it and, and someone tells you, oh, oh, here's a game that you don't know anything or you don't know much about and you have to be really, really small to be good at it. In light of that stereotype that associates the other gender more than your gender with the qualities that are perceived to be required around this game, that might make you not interested in that game. That may make you believe that this is not for you, that this is not something that you can be good at. So with respect to um, that finding uh, of, of the requirement to be really smart, undermining girls' motivation. Um, my preferred explanation is that it has to do with a stereotype that associates intellectual ability with, um, with boys more than girls, with men more than women. Um, so I'm not gonna go over this if you're interested. This is, I just, I pasted this here because we have a, a pretty, well, we try to make a comprehensive taxonomy of different strategies that can help both combat the stereotypes against girls' intellectual abilities and also combat stereotypes about people in STEM, how we're typically uh, perceiving them as um, lonely and selfish and so on and the kind of work that they do as not being for the good of humanity, which it is, um, and children need to be aware um, of this. Um, I want to conclude by thanking all of my wonderful collaborators on this, including my sort of chief partner in crime, Sarah Jane Leslie, who's a philosopher at Princeton, who, with whom we kind of started down this path, and all my wonderful students, um, and you for your attention, and I'm happy to take your questions. And on that note, let me open the Q&A and start um, sorting through some of the questions that have come up there. So I'm just gonna go sort of in order. Does family structure play a role at all where both parents work, just one, oh, just mom or just dad? Um, we haven't been able to investigate this so far, but it's a wonderful question, right? So our sample across the multiple studies that I've told you um, uh, about was just a sample from the general population. So I su suspect that it's a mix of the different family structures, but whether that actually plays a role, we don't have um, specific evidence for from our studies. We know from other studies um, that I'm happy to send you if you send me an email that, um, for example, things like division of chores in the household, for example, the extent to which mom and dad divide chores in the household evenly, um, relates to girls' um, aspirations. So to the extent that girls grow up in a household where mom and dad divide household chores evenly, um, they are more likely to aspire to counter stereotypical um, occupations. So we know from other work that family structure broadly conceived makes a difference. Um, in, this, in the case of this particular stereotype, um, I don't yet have that evidence, but I would be very interested in, in, in looking into it more. Um, any suggestions on how parents might be able to recognize any of their own implicit stereotypes? 
So one thing that you can do that I would recommend if you haven't done this before um, is um, go to Project Implicit. So if you Google Project Implicit, um, you'll, you'll arrive on the, uh, this website where you can take any uh, IAT that you want, and there's a bunch of gender ones too. Um, we did recruit on Project Implicit. They may not have the specific one, but they're probably ones that have to do with like uh, associating women with family and men with work and other things like um, uh, of, of that nature that pertain to gender, as well as the classic sort of racial bias IATs. Um, and that's a good place to start. Project Implicit is very good at providing feedback, so it gives you very um, digestible feedback about where you stand relative to others in terms of the amount of um, implicit bias you, um, you show. Um, so that's a, a wonderful place to start, and they also have additional resources that you can consult once you, once you do some of their tests. Um, What's your view on calling children smart since there's been some recent controversy on using this in language? So this actually brings me back to some of the work that I did in graduate school as well. I think depending on how kids understand smart, to the extent that kids understand smart as a fixed straight, which is unfortunately the, sort of the more common way of understanding what it means to be smart um, in, in our culture, I think that has um, all the downsides of fixed mindset. Right? So, for example, in um, in some of my own research that I've done with Ellen and with Carol Dweck when I was in grad school, but this is not smart per se, but it kind of speaks to this point. We well, we took four year olds at Bing, and we praised them in one of two ways about this drawing they're working on. We either said you're a good drawer, which kind of like speaks to who they are as a person. It's kind of like what we call a generic praise kind of like smart would be uh, in the same way it would work similarly versus you did a good job drawing, which is much more specific, much more about the thing they just did. And then what we did is we exposed them to a mistake. We, um, we uh, had them draw something else and they made a mistake on that. We arranged it such that they made a mistake. And then we measured how motivated they were. The kids that were prayed and, uh, praised in a way that suggested that their initial success was due to something sort of deep about them. You're a good drawer, you're an artist, you're smart, right? Um, reacted much more negatively to um, the subsequent failure because the subsequent failure reflected on something deep about them, right? So, well, I thought I was a good artist. I thought I was smart, for example, um, but now it turns out that I'm not. So generally, I think using praise like, wow, you're so smart is um, uh, not advisable for the reasons that I just mentioned, because it tends to instill um, a fixed mindset, and it tends to, um, as a result, it tends to make children more brutal to failure. Everyone fails in school, everyone makes mistakes, everyone gets bad grades, um, and we need to, to raise kids that are resilient um, in, in those difficult circumstances. And praise that appeals to these internal traits is not um, uh, not uh, liable to do that. So we want to convince girls that they're really, really smart, just as smart as uh, boys are, except not using that language, because that's the bad language that I mentioned before. Um, but we have to be careful in, you know, in what we say so that we don't instill these other um, negative consequences. Um, great question. So what observations can we expect in boys only and girls only elementary school? I think that's a really interesting question. And around the time when this research um, came out, I was approached by several girls-only schools um, because they had what I suspect is a similar intuition to the intuition you have, which is that um, potentially if you school your girl in an environment that uh, is... Uh, girls only, where the teachers might also be um, women, it might be more likely to shield them from uh, these, these negative beliefs that um, girls in the general population, um, I don't think we had any kids that were um, in, in these samples that were um, being schooled at girls only schools. Um, you might shield them from some, acquiring some of these noxious uh, beliefs. Um, we tried to kind of get some research set up along these lines so we can actually investigate um, whether this is this is the case. 
it turns out that it's really difficult to do it well because um, single sex schools in the US attract such a sort of distinct set of parents and such a distinct population that it's really difficult to, um, you know, look at that population and, you know, like, describe their children's stereotypes and draw inferences from the stereotypes to the environment of the school, as opposed to what other attitudes parents might have. So, so parents who send their, their girls to an all-girls school might be um, higher in socioeconomic status, might be more uh, potentially more liberal, depending on what kind of school we're talking about, um, might be more concerned about sexism and wanting to shield their girls from, from these biases. So these girls might get a lot of other sort of benefits from being in the families that come on top of being in a girls only school that makes it really difficult to tease apart like what is the school providing and what is the environment outside of school that these kids are being exposed to providing. Um, I would love to think more about it and figure out a, a good way of testing that but it's really difficult. Um, you know, like we can't randomly assign girls to be to be in co-ed or in girls only schools, which would be kind of like the gold standard. Um, thank you for your question. Um, to what extent is the age five, six split in behavior attributable to, to being able to read? Um, I'm not sure, we haven't measured that. Um, it's possible that being able to read would kind of along with starting to go to school on a regular basis as a, as a six year old um, would expose children to sort of broader ideas of, of society, would expose them to the kinds of things that might suggest to them that society values men more, that thinks men are more competent than women. So it's possible that there will be a relationship there, but I haven't seen anything and we haven't really investigated it either ourselves, but it's an interesting question. Um, Oh, so there's another one about reading. So, so we've discussed that. Have you done any work on this topic with teens? Um, I think the, the oldest children that we've tested so far are the 12 year olds in the Singapore study, which show the strongest version of the implicit stereotypes um, uh, that we've seen so far. So, um, you know, like they're, you know, they're, they're not, teens technically, but they're in the in the ballpark. Um, so I would expect the stereotypes, you know, if we see them in adults and if we see them in, in 12 year olds, I would expect those, those stereotypes to be um, there as well among, among teenagers, but we don't have any direct um, evidence. Um, so looping back to a question from another parent above, do you see any correlation between these stereotypes uh, and interest and race and ethnicity, um, which also has stereotypes about STEM ability? Um, so that's a really interesting question. So, so more and more uh, myself and my lab and other researchers in this area are interested in these questions of intersectionality, right? That's, that's basically what you're asking about. Um, for many years, you know, this researchers who study gender, uh, gender assumed that, you know, like it's men and women, it's boys and girls, and kids' ideas about men and women, boys and girls are going to be the same, um, regardless of the, the race of the boys and girls that you're talking about. But that turns out to be completely, utterly false. Um, and the, these stereotypes vary quite a bit um, by, uh, by the race of the boys and girls and men and women that you're, um, you're asking children about. Um, we know this from a little bit of work on um, stereotypes about, about math, for example, when, um, asked about the math ability of uh, black boys and, and, and girls. Um, children don't show uh, the typical stereotype that they show when asked about boys and girls in general. They don't favor boys over girls um, when asked about um, African-American children. In our own research, we don't see the stereotype um, as clearly when we ask. Um, I haven't presented that, that um, research here. But when we present um, uh, targets, when we present individuals that are African-American in our pictures, we don't see, similar to the evidence that I was just describing for you, we don't see a, a strong gender brilliance um, association. In fact, if anything, it trends in favor of, um, of associating African-American women with being brilliant, more so than African-American uh, men. So these issues are beginning to be investigated in our um, 
are really interesting and, and complex, and I look forward to coming back in a few years and telling you more about what we're finding. Um, correlations with socioeconomic status, yeah, and, and or by inference. So I'm, I'm, I'm um, going to the next question. Yeah, so um, socioeconomic status with respect to stereotypes um, is another very interesting dimension that that some have found to also track with with stereotypes. So, so children from lower socioeconomic um, uh, status strata are also stereotyped negatively in the same way that that, um, that girls are stereotyped negatively with respect to their intellectual abilities. And um, we haven't looked at that, so we haven't crossed socioeconomic status in terms of the targets with um, um, with gender. But that is another sort of dimension of intersectionality. It'll be very interesting to um, to explore here. Do you see these stereotypes um, equally strongly, whether you're looking at men and women, boys and girls, that appear to be of high socioeconomic status, um, as you do um, uh, if you present uh, boys and girls and men and women that are of low socioeconomic status? These are all very interesting questions that we don't yet have the uh, have the answers to. Um, let's see. So I think we discuss the question about race and ethnicity. If anyone has follow-ups, please feel free to um, add another question to the q and I think those are the questions that we had opened so far, um, but I'm, I'm happy to answer more questions should you have them. I'm drinking coffee and 1130. Uh, Andre, could you take your screen share off? Yes, let's do that. Um, so there was another question. Have you seen the response distribution for brilliance, hardworkingness change um, over time? Um, that's a great question. We haven't been doing this work for that long, but that's something that we can, you know, if, if we do a version of the study in five years and in, in 10 years, um, um, we can we can check this across time. Um, there's been a lot of interest recently on how stereotypes about gender change across time. So, for example, there was a recent meta-analysis that came up that looked at that that looked at um, responses to Gallup polls about the the traits of men and women uh, from the 1940s to 2018, which was the last data point that they had, and they found an interesting complex pattern of change on some attributes and not so much change on other attributes. So with respect to um, competence and agency, there was a, a pretty considerable increase in the extent to which um, you know, we were moving toward gender equality. So we, back in the 40s, men were more strongly associated with competence and agency. By agency, I mean sort of ambition, um, uh, uh, the kinds of things that you know, would make a, a breadwinner. Right. Uh, but by, you know, by the time we got to the 2000s, 2010, 2018, um, though that trade was associated equally with men and women. One thing that didn't change in contrast to that um, was were these associations of women with warmth and, and communality. Um, so from the 1940s all the way through uh, 2018, um, these stereotypes uh, that portray women as being more caring, more nurturing, um, if anything, got stronger over time. So um, I haven't been doing this work with respect to intellectual abilities for long enough to have an answer to that particular question, but, um, but we have been seeing with respect to other stereotypes that have been investigated for uh, for longer, uh, pretty strong sort of secular trends with some stereotypes changing more, more than others. And it's interesting to think about why some stereotypes change and, and um, others don't. It's, um, there's only been a lot of attention, for example, on uh, women's status in society and increasing women's participation in the labor force and so on. There's much less attention to how to convince uh, men, how to change men's attitudes toward um, you know, childcare or domestic work, right? So I think that, that potentially that a differential attention that we as a society pay to, um, to these two domains is probably reflected on in what has changed and what has not changed. Um, 
I wanted to ask Mark, should I continue answering questions or should I stop screen sharing? Like, what, what should we do at this point? Um, we can answer a few more questions. Okay. And we'll okay. wrap up. Um, in a few minutes. Okay. In a few minutes, yes. Great. So Mesh is asking, are you working with teachers or administrators to reform textbooks and strategies to alter uh, teacher behavior training? I mean, ultimately, that's where that's where we want to be. However, in working with with teachers and administrators, you have to know exactly what the solutions are that you want to implement, right? And we're nowhere near that that stage yet. Um, but definitely, I mean, I'm doing this work because I want at some point to have something to say to people who interact on a daily basis with children, um, have some suggestions to make of ways that um, they could behave around young children, they could counteract some of these stereotypes that we're identifying. So ultimately, that's that's where we're headed with this work, but we're not there quite yet. Um, Maya is asking, have you ever captured data on parents' professions and looked at correlations between those and responses from their daughters? Um, so this is similar to a question about family structure. So both of these are very interesting. Like what, what about um, the family environment predicts stronger or weaker endorsement of these stereotypes? Um, I don't have data on parents' professions in the studies that we've done so far, but um, in other studies that I know of in the literature that does seem to make a difference to the extent that you see um, your parents achieving equally in the workforce, um, your mom being in the workforce, that it, that seems to uh, track with um, higher counter stereotypical aspirations on the part of on the part of girls. There was a question about uh, that I kind of caught a glimpse of, like elaborate on language. Uh, let me just see if I can scroll down to it uh, to to uh, in, to avoid a fixed mindset. Is that did I pick that up? Anyway, I, I thought. Oh yeah, there we go. Um, so can you please elaborate? Michelle asks, can you please elaborate on the type of uh, appropriate language to use with children to motivate them and counteract a fixed mindset? So um, in terms of feedback um, to, to provide to children in, in language that's appropriate in achievement contexts, um, I think what you want to aim for, and this is, I'm just now you know, reciting to you some of the, some of the research that Carol Dweck has done um, over the last three or four years, um, the type of feedback that works best at motivating children, keeping them um, uh, resilient in the face of failure is feedback that uh, directs their attention to the process by which they, they achieve success. So for example, if a child does well on an exam, rather than saying, oh, wow, you're so smart, you're a math person, I'm so proud of you, right? These are all things that um, explain the success that the child achieved in terms of sort of general properties of them as a person, right? Like, I'm proud of you as a person. You're a math person. You're really smart. There's something deep about you that explains this. All of those are likely to make children feel more vulnerable when, um, you know, in a, in a future situation, they fail, as everyone does at some point in, uh, in life. The kind of language that is less likely to produce that and, and more likely to produce resilient children is language that directs them to the process. So you, you got a, a good grade on this math exam. Um, let's look at your strategies. What strategies did you use? I, you know, like I like that you spent a lot of time and you, you know, like you looked over your homework and you practiced and that enabled you to do well, right? So directing them to the process by which they achieved success or what rang, went wrong in the process that led to a mistake or a failure is um, in study after study has been found to be um, the sort of the most resilient strategy of talking to children about um, achievement, like resilience inducing uh, strategy um, because it avoids um, the tendency that children might have otherwise to uh, tie their successes and failures to their worth as a, um, as a person and important traits they, they might have. Um, what stereotypes do boys have that could make them feel uh, lesser? Anything other than creativity, um, caregiving? Um, I don't 
Yes, I mean, uh, boys and men are definitely sort of like the higher status group in society, and higher status groups usually have a lot more positive stereotypes associated with them than negative stereotypes associated with them. So other than um, sort of the things that have to do with the lower warmth, so being unemotional, being unavailable, being... Um, you know, sort of like emotionally undeveloped, things like that. Those are the kinds of things that most often um, are perceived as being lower and less developed in men than in women. So that, that is by far the most prominent context in which boys and men are sort of at a disadvantage or perceived to be disadvantaged in the context of, um, of our um, society. And unfortunately, these stereotypes also kind of seep into their own values to the extent they perceive society as um, perceiving their group as, you know, being less warm, less caring, less likely to care about other people's feelings. Um, they, their values change as a result as well. And they start valuing sort of interpersonal communal things less. This is work that um, one of the postdocs in my lab, Kate Block is doing right now. And that is a real problem, right? Because if you start caring less about people, we're right? like, we don't want people in our society, like half of the people in our society to think that, you know, like, um, you know, being warm, being kind, being friendly is something that they don't, that they're not obligated to do it, that is not a worthwhile thing for, for them to do. So I think there's an increasing emphasis, at least in the, in the kind of research that I've seen in, in, um, on gender to figure out ways to sort of work on the other side of this problem, right? So it's one thing to try to uh, boost women's confidence to pursue um, you know, careers that are at this point in time masculine, but an important part of that problem, sort of the, the, the other side of the same coin, is um, convincing men that they don't have to go into STEM. There are other things they can. They, there are other things they can do. It's entirely appropriate um, for them to, uh, you know, to stay home and take care of the kid. I mean, it's a difficult argument when society is still kind of like uh, frowns on men and doing this. When you still get that sort of like sideways glances when you're the dad, the only dad at the playground with, you know, like with your kid and so on. So it's not something that we can resolve overnight, but it's something that we definitely need to be working towards. Oh, thank you, Jeffrey. Oh, hi. <laughs> well, from all of us at Bing, I would like to extend our deepest thanks to Professor Simpian for speaking with us tonight. We much appreciate your kindness in accommodating our schedule from the East Coast, because I know I think it's 1130 now on, in New York, so I, I, that's why you are drinking coffee. <laughs> so, anyway, um, it's nice well, it's a pleasure. Yeah, well, it was really fascinating and a very relevant topic that um, is really an interest to all of us. Um, I'd also like to thank Java Ye, Mark Mabry, Emma Valerino, and Beth Wise for putting on this wonderful event and attending to all the details to make this so successful. Um, I'd also like to thank um, all of our Bing parents, the educators, and members of the Bing community who have joined us this evening. We appreciate your interest and your involvement in our programs, and this distinguished lecture is a highlight of our event calendar. So thanks again for being with us tonight. We look forward to seeing you again in person soon. So good night and stay well. Night, everyone. Night.